So today we are going to be joined by Carl Gavin, who is a professor, a lovely turn of phrase, professor of project management. As part of this original thinking series, we hear from new and recently promoted professors in Alliance Manchester Business School who are delivering their inaugural lectures. As always, I'm delighted to uh, see so many colleagues here to support Carl. We also welcome an online audience from across the globe. So thank you also to all of you who are joining us from, as I say, from many countries. Thank you for coming along to today's event, wherever you're joining us from. So I'm also very pleased to say that we have Carl's family here with us today. So Carl's wife, Carolyn, son, Richard, and his girl from Imoni are here with us. And also very specially, Carl's parents, Val and Joe, are here to mark this significant milestone in Carl's academic career, which is really wonderful. So Carl graduated with a first class honours degree in computer science from the University of Liverpool in 1989 and went on to undertake a PhD in software engineering of manufacturing systems sponsored by Anderson Consulting, now Accenture. Near completion of his PhD, Carl secured research funding from the Science and Engineering Research Council to continue his research. Over the next few years, he rapidly went through most of the research job titles, it says here, <laughs> that the university had to offer before being appointed a lecturer and director of studies in the Department of Industrial Studies, which is now the University of Liverpool School of Management. There he taught project management, industrial engineering and manufacturing information systems engineering. After 11 years at Liverpool, Carl gained industrial experience in project management with the intention of returning to academia. With the benefit of that experience of four or five years, four or five years outside academia, however, this didn't quite go to plan. As I say, the intention to be out for about five years from academia turned out to be 15 years with Carl working in SEMA Group Consulting as Managing Consultant based in London, managing major projects for the Home Office and what was then the world's largest implementation of a database for Transco, Transco, which is now National Grid. In 1999, Carl was headhunted to head, head up the software design division of a computer games company, Codemasters, based in Leamington Spa, a role Carl describes as a unique combination of both dream job and nightmare job. Uh, and you might want to ask him more about that in the drink after this talk. I'm certainly interested to find out what that's about. <laughs> This experience led Carl to set up a software company back in Liverpool, developing award-winning simulation and virtual reality products for Shell, English Heritage, North Wales Police, and various city and borough councils, universities, and colleges. Carl headed up the business as managing director for 10 years. In 2009, Carl sold his stake in the business and worked for Liverpool Football Club for two years, despite being an Evertonian by birth. <laughs> in late 2011, Carl was pulled back into academia after receiving a number of emails. Friends directed Carl to a job advert for a lecturer, senior lecturer in project management and deputy, deputy director of an executive education program for PP at what, at what was then Manchester Business School. The emails apparently all said essentially the same thing this job is you. So Carl applied and was appointed senior lecturer in project management here in February 2012, working with BP and then significantly from 2015 with BAE Systems. Since joining the school, Carl has dedicated himself without any doubt to delivering the best executive education experience and learning for all of our clients. And we're very grateful and proud of everything that he's done for the school and the university. I am delighted to hear that some of the senders of those, of those emails back in 2012 
directing Carl to his early first role with us are here this afternoon, either in person or online, and as friends and as colleagues, many friends and colleagues are also here from right across Carl's career, from PhD colleagues, from fellow researchers, lecturers and professors, and colleagues also from his time in industry, in consulting, in the computer games industry, and from indeed when Carl ran his own software business. We also have a large contingent of colleagues from BAE Systems, which is indicative testimony of the strong and lasting relationships that Carl has built with people across the businesses through the executive education programs we deliver for, for BAE Systems. Now, the event this afternoon is going to be facilitated by Eleanor O'Connor, who is a professor of work psychology and also deputy head of Alliance Manchester Business School. There will be plenty of time, as always, towards the end of today's session for your questions. Uh, and those in the room should simply raise their hands in the traditional way. And then for colleagues who are joining us online, please do chat type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll certainly be integrating both sets of questions um, into the Q&A ses um, session later on. So without further ado, let me ha now hand over to Carl. Thank you very much, Carl. If you keep that up for the next 30 minutes, it will uh, make things a lot easier. I'm absolutely stunned at the turnout. Thank you. I do need to double check something, though. Apparently, there is a Eurovision charity extravaganza starting at this very moment in the Whitworth Hall. So if you're here for that, I'm afraid uh, you're in the wrong place. I am absolutely humbled by um, the turnout and seeing so many friends. I know people have come from London, from Wiltshire. Uh, from a large contingent from the Preston area for some reason. Um, and I am I am deeply grateful uh, for, for, for the turnout. Right. So most of you know me. I am Carl Gavin, and I am pleased and rather relieved to say that I am a professor of project management within executive education within Alliance Manchester Business School. I thought I would give you a, a quick overview of what, what I've been doing around these her ear parts uh, since 2012. So I was appointed to be deputy director of a program, executive education program we run for BP. Professor Graham Winch appointed me. Um, I'm grateful for that appointment, Graham. And I was responsible for running the day-to-day -day, um, aspects of that program until the oil price crash. Uh, I don't know what crystal ball Graham had, but he stepped down as deputy dir as director and I was made program director just before the oil price crash. And so I spent I spent most of a year recosting and recosting and recosting the program for for BP. Um, they decided to put the program into suspended animation. And thankfully, in 2019, it came back and uh, we've, we've, had, we've had one cohort per year now for I mean, hopefully for the next five years. So BP has, has, has not gone away. In May, June of 2015, we were asked to bid for a program with BAE Systems. And it, we went and presented our bid as in a meeting room in a, a hotel in Farnborough, not far from where BAE Systems were based there. And we walked into what was it's a bit of a depressed atmosphere because apparently we were the last on after two days of presentations and the, thankfully the universities before that had, had totally missed the mark in terms of their presentations. You know, universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Cranfield. <laughs> um, and we, we won the bid, much to our surprise, I think as much as BA Systems. Um, but we 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 delivered what BA Systems in the, in the presentation for the bid what they wanted what they wanted from the program, and that was the start of a very fruitful um, collaboration. So the main program that we won in 2015 was uh, leading complex projects programs and portfolios. And I wish I've had I had a penny for every time I've had to say 
complex projects, programs and portfolios over the past eight years. I'm going to say it a fair amount um, in the presentation. So that program is still going. It's going from strength to strength. We just recently launched cohort 21. A cohort is about 35 senior project leaders from the business. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we, we're, that's still, still being delivered and growing and, and improving along the way, of course. Um, in 2017, I was asked uh, to, uh, Stuart Forsyth uh, arranged a presentation to the board of directors of BA Systems because they wanted to know um, what, why this particular program was having the impact that it was. And at that meeting of the board of directors, who were a bunch of lovely people, I have to say, uh, they commissioned sponsoring complex projects, programs, and portfolios, SCP3, um, which was mandated by the chair and the CEO for the top 110 executives across the business globally. And again, that is we've we've delivered on that promise. We've delivered to 109 um, executives within the business, and we're looking at uh, repurposing that program going forward. That led to another program with BA Systems, so a, a more foundational program. But when I say foundational, these are project managers with three to five, perhaps more uh, years experience in project management. And so we've been delivering that since uh, before the pandemic. And we are up to cohort 12 of that now. And um, yeah, we've, we've delivered to a fair amount of uh, people through that program as well. And we shouldn't forget another program that we won with BA Systems. This one did go out uh, for commercial uh, procurement and we won beating the likes of Oxfield, Oxford, Cranfield and uh, those, those universities that you may not have heard of. Um, and that's GROW. It's an engineering uh, leadership uh, management program, engineering manufacturing leadership program, and it's a sister program to LCP3. And uh, again, that's a program that we, we're up to cohort nine of that now. I'm very pleased to say that recently we've won a program with National Trust and we've got Nick Sharp and Mike Hudson from the National Trust with us today. And that's a program that's going to be delivered to their very senior project sponsors within the organization and uh, looking at complex project sponsorship. And as of two weeks ago, I'm very pleased to report that we've won a major program with Atomic Weapons Establishment, AWE. And we're going to be delivering versions of the LCP3 and ICP3 and potentially SCP3 programs to AWE with BA Systems Blessing. So that's that's a, a really good news um, in terms of the development um, from those first days of BP, looking at complex project management. And we've built up a portfolio in executive education to do that. Um, I'm very pleased to say that I am. I, I'm, I'm honoured to call myself a professor of project management at this very institution and the institutions that came before the University of Manchester, the Victoria University of Manchester, and also UMIST that came together to form this university. This institution has a strong heritage in project management. It's where the first academic research into project management started in the early 60s. Um, Professor Stephen Wern and John Perry back then. The first PhDs in project management were at this institution. Um, and amongst those, those, those first PhD students were a couple of people called Martin Barnes and Peter Morris, who went on to have a tremendous effect and impact on project management profession itself. The first university professor of project management, Peter Thompson, was appointed at this institution in the 1980s. And uh, where's Callum? Callum's there. In, in 1990s, um, there was the MSc in Project Management Professional Development for Rolls-Royce was launched, which was a forerunner of the executive education programs that we run for BP, BA Systems, and now others. I'm also pleased to say that this is the institution where the Iron Triangle was, uh, was, was created by one of those PhD, first PhD students in project management, uh, Dr. Martin Barnes. He was successful in his PhD. And we had a doctoral symposium yesterday over in the engineering school, which um, was talking of the, the, the benefits or otherwise of the, of the Iron Triangle. Martin Barnes 
and Peter Morris were very much involved in the founding of what was the Association for Project Managers, well, Project Managers, but became the Association for Project Management. Uh, Martin was chair of uh, the APM and asked Peter Morris uh, to help create the first APM body of knowledge in the early 90s. And which, so they had this conversation and it led to what has become a, uh, a number of editions of the APM body of knowledge for project management over the years. So there's a Manchester connection there. And wouldn't it be nice if Manchester were involved in the next edition of the uh, Association for Project Management uh, body of knowledge? All I'm allowed to say by APM, we have Homer Young here today, so you can take this back to uh, Adam that I'm being very good, um, is that discussions are in place. So uh, it would be great to um, continue that tradition of being involved in the body of knowledge. So there's those early founders of academic research uh, within this institution have had a tremendous impact and it continues to this day. So I'm very pleased to count as, as colleagues um, over the years, the likes of Damon Hodgson, Mark Winter, Eunice Materania, Graham Winch, David Lowe, who all continued to contribute to uh, the evolution of project management practice, and also many others. There are many other academics involved in, in, in both the business school and in the engineering school. So I'm pleased to stand alongside those colleagues uh, now as a professor of project management. Right, I have a very large clock here because time becomes an illusion when I start talking, so I'm, I'm going to do my best. I've only got half an hour uh, to go through uh, what I'd like to talk about. So it's, it's a very simple argument and I'll try and do it as best and uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, so I want to do a little preamble on projects and project management and then talk a bit about project sponsorship and its challenges. Um, I've been commissioned by the Major Projects Association with Andy, Andy is here, Andy Murray, CEO, um, to look at the current state of, of best practice within project sponsorship. I'm not going to spoil that presentation, um, which is to come that work. There's a seminar in June, which I will plug at the end of, of the lecture. Well, in order to do that work, I had to create a framework for project sponsorship, which didn't exist. I couldn't find one within the literature in order to evaluate the bodies of knowledge and the various other best practices within sponsorship. And then I want to introduce the concept of the chief project officer. That's going to take that be quite quick because there's not a lot of literature, as I discovered, on this particular role. And then I want to explore whether the chief project officer role could actually help us improve sponsorship. Then there'll be Q&A facilitated by Eleanor and then thing that I'm particularly looking forward to is the drinks reception. <laughs> I do want to spend three minutes though making some thank yous because I've got a captive audience both uh, in the classroom and also online and I'd like to thank people in the order that I met them in my life and career just to be <laughs> not everybody not everybody will be here um so the first people i'd like to thank are the first people that i met along with some medical professionals that i don't remember the name of and that was back in 1967 um and that's my mom and dad who were at the back so um i just want to thank you for all the support you've given me in my career I'm trying not to get too emotional. Um, over the years, I've had some twists and turns in my careers, and you've been in my career, and you've been very um, supportive. And it may have felt a bit strange at times. This is the rewritten history. Um, the reality is probably a bit more disturbing than that. I am pleased, though, as a little aside, that I actually did fulfil that ambition. Um, for a science fiction exhibition in Glasgow in 1997, I was a Dalek, gliding around the exhibition spaces, terrorizing young children. It was really good training for teaching undergraduates. Uh, there's the photographic evidence. Okay. So thank you. Thank you to my parents for all your support. The next person I want to thank, I met in sixth form in September 1985. 
and that's my wife Carolyn. And I was a spotty computer obsessed teenager at the time. And not only was Carolyn willing to talk to me, but she could program in 6502 assembly language. <laughs> now, as you all know, the 6502 is an 8 bit processor with a 16 bit address bus, and it doesn't use sequential um, read only memory, but a programmable logic array for instruction decoding and execution and uses zero page processing in order to uh, reach all the 64K of its memory in a single byte instruction. As you know, such things lead to marriage. So, again, thank you for all your support. You've had to put up with an awful lot over the last 11 years. This is a reconstruction of my wife's viewpoint um, whilst I've been doing the work for the MPA. Um, those eight piles of books are an actual photograph of the eight piles of books that were in our living room, which eventually got whittled down um, as, the, as the work progressed. So thank you. The next people I want to thank, I met, started to meet in 2012, and that's everybody who's been involved within the business school and also across the university with helping me deliver the excellent executive education programs that we do. There's a lot of people who I am very grateful for and that need to express thanks to. It's in alphabetical order by surname. So if you're looking for your name, if your name isn't on there, if your name isn't on there, it's not deliberate. I've tried to rack my brains of everybody I've worked with who've directly supported and taught on those executive programs over the years. Uh, I am very, very, very thankful for all your support. The last thank group of thank yous come, come, takes us to 2015. And I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for the work that we've done with BA Systems over the past eight years. It's transformed my career, it's transformed my academic, academic thinking, it's transformed my life. It also gave me the opportunity to visit the original Starship Enterprise in, in, a, in, a, in the Washington Museum, such things like that. There are other things like that, but I won't go into them. Um, so I particularly want to thank the commissioning clients of those programs. So Professor Stuart Forsyth for uh, selecting us um, in, in our Farnborough uh, meeting room, and also Sue for all that you're doing, uh, now being the, the commissioning client for those programs and for taking it forward. So I'm very grateful for that. And also for the teams from BA Systems who've been involved in supporting those programs. I will have missed out people from that. So please forgive me if, if, if you spot anyone who's not. On, on that list. Okay, so thank you. Um, by law, I, as a professor of project management, I have to ask this question, what is a project, just so that we're on the same page, and also you may be here for the Eurovision charity extravaganza and are embarrassed to, uh, to, to leave the room. So I won't go through these, the, these, these are just really uh, to help with the discussion, but projects are these, temporary organizations of people and resources which are intended to deliver some change something new uh, and it can the, the extent of, of the complicatedness or the complexity of that projects go from simple to in the likes of BA systems and atomic weapons establishment exceptionally complex and a point I just want to make is those those projects for an, an organization can be externally focused. So they could be delivering a product, an asset or change for customers outside the organization. But also there can be projects that are delivering a product, asset or change for stakeholders within the organization, improving the way that that organization does business. I'll be coming back to that point uh, later on. This is one of those slides that's not meant to be read, but is there to, to be skim read and to make a point. Um, and that is, as a management discipline, project management has developed considerably since the 90s. Uh, some scholars um, argue that project management goes back to the times of the Great Pyramids and the Great Wall of China. It probably goes back further than that, pardon me. Um, but the two world wars, influenced the techniques we use today and then in the 1950s again largely driven by the defense and aerospace industries project management as a discipline uh, took its form 
However, these are recent statistics on the percentage of projects that meet their original objectives. And you can see there's quite a disparity in the range um, of these statistics. So the PMI is the most optimistic with about three quarters of projects deliver um, it to, to, to their original objectives. Um, Paul Barship from the Independent Projects uh, Analysis Group in the US um, is a bit more, a little bit less um, optimistic, 60% of projects. And in terms of in, in mega projects, which are projects with budgets over a billion dollars, you can see Maro says 35% so only a third of the projects, mega projects achieve their objectives. And then there's, there's a variation there. You can see the, the APM is a bit more pessimistic than the Project Management Institute when it comes to those success rates. And then the recent book by Ben Flipberg um, is very pessimistic when it comes to mega projects in that 0.5% of those projects um, deliver on their objectives. So even though this management discipline has been around for quite a while and is evolving, we're still not at the 90% or the 100% of meeting objectives that we would like to. And Paul Barshop made a, a point in his, his book that was discussing this that actually stuck with me. 60% so is not much better than a coin flip. That's not great odds going into delivering um, a major project. And even if you took the average of those statistics there, if you include um, bent flip 0.5%, you get about 38%, which is a lot less favorable than the coin flip, perhaps. Um, and without that, you'd see 48%. So, so around that coin flip. So why is it that we're not quite hitting those 80s, 90% in terms of the project success? Is it something about projects, the nature of projects themselves? There are no facts about the future when we're planning our projects. We're, it's all based on best guesses and estimates that we, as project professionals. Is it because the environment in which projects are being delivered is becoming more complex? You've, you've heard of the expression VUCA, more volatile, more uncertainty, more complexity, more ambiguity around the projects that we're, we deliver. And just to drive home the point, this is a management of discipline which there is a lot of academic thinking being put into trying to come up with the solutions to these, these issues. This is just the frequency of uh, academic peer reviewed um, articles from Scopus um, over the years. You can see there was a bit of a, a, a peak in the early 2000s, but the number of academic peer reviewed journal articles on project management is increasing. And if you looked at Google Books and Gram Viewer, you would see a very similar trend. Obviously, the numbers would be higher because it includes professional and educational texts. And you would see a peak in the early 80s when project management methodologies particularly became favorable. So I was trying to think of a classic analogy for this challenge that we're facing. So is it similar to Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill and never quite uh, uh, reaching the top and uh, rolling back? Is it Hercules fighting the Hydra where he chops off one of the heads and two heads grows in its place? We resolve a challenge and yet we find more challenges emerging in our projects. And then I thought, no, we're in Manchester. We're in Greater Manchester. Wigan's not that far away. Let's use the analogy of pies. So improving project delivery is like a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie which as you can tell, I actually think is, is, is a good thing in terms of academic challenge, we're also a like pie. What I'd like to do is turn our attention to project sponsorship in particular. And this again, not one, it's not one of those slides that's not really meant to be read, um, but this indicates research over the past uh, 20 odd years or so, which is looking at project success and failure. And one of the, elements of success that come out time and time again in this research is the importance of a project sponsor in ensuring that success. And that's what I would like to explore in the remainder of our time together. However, from 
being commissioned to look at the literature by the Major Projects Association, asking the question and getting an answer to it of who is the sponsor is very vague. There's a lot of ambiguity around who the sponsor is. Yes, we know it's important, but who is the sponsor? What should they be doing in particular? And in the literature, the sponsor is referred to by a variety of different terms, sometimes within the same publication. And it was just, again, a bit of an aside, but going back in history, I had a bit of a forehead slap moment when I realized why the sponsor was called the sponsor. Uh, the sponsor was originally the person who wrote the check. There used to be three uh, individuals, uh, senior individuals around, it, it advocated in terms of projects, the owner, the champion, and the sponsor, the person who wrote the check. And over time, those roles have conflated. And when we think of a sponsor now, we think of an advocate, a champion of that project or, or program. And that's where I would wanted to explore in the work I've been doing. Again, I'm not gonna read this out to you. These are the different varieties of, of definitions of what a sponsor is. Um, and it's usually a person who is accountable for the success of that project and the delivering of the objectives that meet the identified needs of that project. So you can see there's uh, this accountability. So what I want to present to you is a framework that I developed for exploring sponsorship. In the MPA work, uh, I use it to assess the various bodies of knowledge, um, but what I want to do is present it to you as a way of explaining what is expected of the sponsor and then we'll turn our attention quickly to uh, the chief project officer. So this on our executive education programs BA systems have contributed to this and this is a leadership model that has such an impact on our executive education delegates and I want to use this as one of the bases for this framework that I've developed and it comes it's draws from work done by Professor Deborah Ancona, who we've had as a guest speaker on, on our BA systems programs in the US, looking at what is essentially leadership. And we found that this has been a very useful thing for looking at complex project leadership and hopefully it'd be of use in its own right. So the first thing that a, an effective leader does is sense make. So they make sense of the environment in which their organization or project is, is operating in. So that they, they look around and uh, all the good stuff that we teach on our MBAs, um, but also internally within their organization. I'll come back to that as well. So they sense make. But what they also do, and this complements that sense making, is they relate, they build trusting relationships with those stakeholders involved in the project, be they customers, owners, people internal to the business, and so on. So they build those relationships, and these two things inform each other. And I just wanted to again a little bit of an aside but when it comes to looking at our own project organizations or our own organizations that sense making and relating helps helps with a particular problem that as with that senior leaders face the, the more you go higher within an organization the less you know about what's happening within your organization so this is called the iceberg of ignorance it comes out of research into japanese automotive companies by sydney yoshida but sense making and relating can help with this. Um, another piece of research by um, Granny and Maxfield and colleagues say that the, the, this is this is a, effectively a crisis of silence within our projects, and a way of combating this is for leaders to sense make, relate, have skip level sessions, find out what's happening within their organisation. That's the enabling axis of this leadership model. Effective leaders also set the vision of where this endeavor is going, be it an organization or a project. So the sense making and the relating gives them a map of what currently is. The visioning gives a map of where we want to go with our particular project. And then we work with our teams, with our stakeholders, those external companies in order to develop ways to achieve that vision, the inventing. So around the circle, that's the action axis around the circle is what effective leaders do, particularly in a complex project environment. And um, what we did on the BA systems programs and Stuart, uh, where are you Stuart? 
uh, won the argument in terms of what they should be called. Um, we wanted to add into this model what leaders are. What do you bring? What do you and your team bring to this leadership? And so we added acumen, um, the experience and judgment that um, a leader brings to that table. But this is not a solo heroic activity. You have to work. This is a distributed leadership model. You have to work with your team, with your stakeholders in order to do this effectively. The second model I want to present very quickly is Graham's three domains of project organizing, which states that there are three main types of organizations with, of, of different natures involved in a complex project endeavor. There's the owner domain. So this is the, the owner of the project, who the project is being delivered to. There is the, the supply domain where the various suppliers um, reside and help deliver that project. They are permanent organizations. And then there's the delivery domain. So this temporary organization, that's the project itself that is delivering that project. And what's really interesting is the interfaces between those domains. So the interface between the owner and the supplier is the commercial domain the interface, which governs how those suppliers contribute to that project. The suppliers provide the resources in terms of people and equipment and so on and to the project and the owner, hopefully in, that, in the governance interface, make sure that the project is delivering what it wanted. And that's held together by leadership, that those interfaces are integrated and coordinated by leadership. And they, they may be different organizations, or this may reside in one organization. So Graham and I were called into a um, company by Alan Whiteside, Alan's here, um, to explore issues around sponsorship with that organization. And every all these domains were within that particular um, organization based in Switzerland. It sounds nice, but it was the bit of Switzerland that looks like an industrial park outside Wigan. Um, and in internal organizations, if you have those domains within, a, within one organization, those interfaces tend not to be contractually managed and as rigorous as they will be if they were separate organizations. So for the purposes of a sponsorship and apologies to Graham and team, I've added a fourth domain to this model, which is the external domain, the environment, the sea in which this um, endeavor and these domains reside. And I want to use that as a basis for just exploring what project sponsorship is and then make the link with the chief project officer. So we just move our domains around and think about the project sponsor in an owner organization at a project level. So what's expected? If you look at the best practices, the guidebooks, the bodies of knowledge, what is expected of a project sponsor within that organization? Well, they represent the interests of the board, the portfolio, the program above them. So they're owning and governing that project on behalf of the owner. But they're also expected to direct and support the delivery team within the delivery domain, the project manager and the team. They're also expected to do the sense making relating with their internal stakeholders. So engaging and advocating, being the champion their project and also similarly with their external stakeholders in the supplier domain and the external domain so this framework does that has been a framework like this for sponsorship before i could not find one at all in the literature so i'm hoping this is is something that uh, is a contribution and in terms of our leadership model the axes remain so the the engaging and advocating is broadly the sense making and relating and the owning and governing and directing and sporting are broadly the visioning and the inventing of our leadership model and this if we go uh, once one stage higher so we have our program of projects it's the same but the names change and who you interface with is slightly different and at the portfolio level, so at the highest level of projects and programs within our business, this is aspirational because if you look at the literature, there's not much mention of sponsorship at the portfolio level, which is something I'm going to be digging into a bit more. But again, similar expectations, but different level. 
If we go back to our sponsor, we can also use this to address sponsorship within our supplier organization. So in the literature, there is an assumption that the sponsor works for one organization. It seems to be an unwritten assumption. But actually, if we look at a supplier project sponsor within a supplier organization to the owner, the expectations are the same, but where they interface is different. So the internal stakeholders for a sponsor within a supplier organization is within the supplier domain. And that's something that's not really evident in the literature. The fact the responses in these different domains, the literature assumes that the sponsor is either in the, the, the owner domain or in a supply domain and doesn't really talk about the interface. So again, this is potentially something for further research. And before we move on to the chief project officer, there was a very, if I may say so, a very nice uh, uh, co-written article with Stuart's um, in APM Project Journal recently on how to be a highly effective uh, sponsor. And uh, we identified from the work that we've been doing in sponsorship with BA Systems and, and other organizations, some problems around sponsors. The problem is the role of the sponsor is not clearly defined within organizations. Sponsors do not know what's expected of them. Project teams don't know to what to expect of sponsors. And in some circumstances, project teams don't even know who their sponsors are. And the sponsor role is often a day-to-day -day addition to the role as a senior leader within an organization, which means that sponsors actually don't have the time. Now, there are organizations like Transport for London that have formal sponsor roles and a whole hierarchy of, of that. Um, and some, as we've found in, in some of our work, some people are nominated to be sponsors without their knowledge um, or reluctantly, reluctantly accept the role. And on one hand, sponsors can be not very involved and not bothered about the projects. And on the other hand, they can be very, very micromanaging um, and acting as a high level project manager. And we've, we've all got evidence of poor behaviors from sponsors, such as receiving news about poor project performance badly. And this, this is interesting, and this is, doesn't seem to have been addressed much, although I'm pleased to say the National Trust is, is, is uh, doing this now. Um, there's a, a lack of formal onboarding and training of sponsors. And there is a great reluctance to actually measure and address the performance of sponsors. And some of that comes from, from the fact that these are very senior people within an organization, and so you're very unwilling. It, it takes a brave person to tell their senior leader that they're not acting very great, very good at uh, being a sponsor. And there's a few other issues since we wrote the article. So the guidance in the literature and best practice guides and so on, it's very vague and typically from a project manager's viewpoint. And also there's the, again, not very much addressed, who actually is the sponsor of improving project management within an organization. Right, which brings us to the chief project officer. Is the room on in the C-suite or the board, as I tend to call it, for a chief project officer? Now, very interestingly, there is not a lot in the literature about this. In fact, this is pretty much it, other than um, editorials and blog posts about wouldn't it be a good idea if, if the project if projects had a, had a voice at board level? So it's very, it was very easy for me to do a literature review of, of this uh, scant literature. And I just want to focus on three main points that these articles were making. The chief project officer is there to help improve board understanding and decision making. I won't read these out to you, but they're there to assist their fellow C-suite colleagues in understanding uh, project management and the importance and the benefits realization from the projects that they choose to do. They can also improve the capability of an organization to deliver projects in terms of the skills and capabilities, but they can also, particularly when it comes to having a line for sponsorship, improve the project delivery, the delivery of those projects themselves. So this really is opening up the discussion within um, the, the field and to answer the question will the role of the chief project officer solve all of our project problems well i want to invoke Hinchcliffe's rule 
also known as Bestridge's or Davis, Davis's rule, depending on who you, which book you read. But if a title is in the form of a yes, no question, the answer to that question is no. Um, but perhaps, perhaps the chief project officer can help give us clarity around sponsorship within an organization by having that clear line of accountability in sponsorship. I'll put dotted line around the chief project officer and the portfolio sponsor because they may be the same person. Again, that's something that needs to be discussed. But also they can sponsor the improvement of project management capability and the delivery of projects within their organizations as well, as well as helping improve that broad board understanding in the decision making around projects. As I say, I've been doing some work for the Major Projects Association. I promised the MPA not to spoil that for them. So we will be uh, delivering the, the outcome of that work in June in Manchester. And um, so if you'd like to come to that, please uh, go to the MPA website. And I'd like to finish on something that will be edited out of the final version of this presentation that is uploaded to uh, YouTube, the, the ABM, AMBS channel, mainly for reasons of academic credibility. I have made a few science fiction references. Those that know me of old are probably wondering why there hasn't been more. It is because I am on my best behavior. Um, but there is something I would like to leave you with before we go to the Q&A, just something to ponder. So, Professor Gavin, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations on, on a, a, a fascinating and uh, very entertaining and awful lecture. Thank you for that. So, um, I'm sure there will be very many questions from the floor and indeed to possibly from the people who are joining us online today. Um, I'm going to begin with a question, if I may. And you talk about this idea of the chief projects officer. It's it, it's very much a, a sort of a new entity, as you say, very, very little uh, in the literature about this concept so far. Clearly, the role has to be defined. The responsibilities have to be uh, to, uh, defined as well. I'm a professor of psychology, so I'm going to ask you a psychologically orientated question. Okay. And that is, with such a complex role, potentially, what sort of characteristics do you think we would need to have in somebody taking on that role? What attributes would they, would they need? I'm going to answer as a professor of project management. <laughs> <laughs> um, they need to have the attributes to be an effective executive. They would be on the board, the C-suite of an organization. So the people skills, the strategic, um, the acumen that we talked about at the center of, of the leadership model that we've got. But they all, as, as speaking as a professor of project management, <laughs> um, they need to have project management experience and knowledge because as we saw they are going to be explaining and helping the board make decisions and understand the, the decisions that they make and also the decisions around changing projects mm -hmm. in execution as well so i would answer that question in all the good stuff that we teach on our mbas um, in terms of developing board leaders of the future or also with that added project management expertise and mm. knowledge. Yeah, so a complex role, certainly. Yeah. Good, fascinating. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions from uh, our audience today. I think what we'll do is we'll begin perhaps with just some questions from the floor, um, and then we'll have maybe three or so questions from the floor, then we'll see if there are any online and we'll come back to the floor, because I want to make sure we don't uh, we don't forget those people who are joining us online today and we give them an opportunity to to contribute to the discussion um, so obviously Abby has some roving mics so are there any questions from the floor any hands anybody want to raise any questions yeah you have a gentleman in the check shirt thank you so Professor Carl um, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for a couple of things <laughs> First of all, great presentation. Um, I also took away two main things, which is the Iron Triangle was invented here in Manchester, which I didn't know. Um, and I'm also really interested as to why you put the Alan Parsons project 
on your project timeline? Because I've never seen that in a project management formal presentation before. Well, the title of the slide was Significant Development in Projects, and it is a joke I've been wanting to do for about 11 <laughs> years to get the Alan Parsons project into a, 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 such a slide. So I am impressed that you spotted it. <laughs> I'm impressed you put it on there. So well thank done. You. And thank you very much. It's not often that you get a progressive rock project joke. <laughs> Well, let's face it, it's your day, Carl, so you can put whatever you like in there. <laughs> Any further questions from the floor? Yes, the gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Hendra. Um, having been a product manager back in the 90s, yeah, uh, a, a product manager, and I always find a lot of, um, um, let's say, uh, you know, uh, it's not a clash, but a disparity or a redundancy between project managers and us at that time as product managers. How would product managers, chief product manager office and chief product project officer office be on the same line? Or how, how would you think that would be? Thank you. You would, well, it, 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 you would expect there to be hopefully healthy tensions at board level when it comes to the various members of the board discussing and deciding upon what's best for their organization. So it'd be similar to what you would expect tensions to be with, between the chief operating officer now and the chief finance officer, and also perhaps chief information officer and technology officer. That It is a team coming together to determine what's best for their organization. Um, there's a part of your question I can't answer. Um, without a crystal ball, but um, you would hope that each member of that board is advocating um, for what, what they feel is right for their organization, but also that they're on the same team and that they would work towards a common strategic goal, um, a, an agreed uh, decision on what's best for the organization. Got another question there, Abby, and then I think we'll... Uh... Uh, hi, Carl. Is there a risk that the sponsor becomes a scapegoat and everything that doesn't get done on a project is lumped onto the poor sponsor's shoulders? Uh, as you say, most of them have a day job to do as well. Um, what do you think about that as a direction that the project management community seems to have been taken over the past 20 years or so? is that give more and more and more to this poor so-and-so who's called a sponsor? Well, the sponsor is getting the flack, if, if you read the literature anyway, <laughs> at the moment, because the, the, the flip side of, of the sponsor playing a crucial role is that when projects go wrong, the sponsor is, or lack of sponsorship is a significant element mm -hmm. of that. Um, I would hope that having that clarity of structure, similar to what, what, what some organisations um, like Transport for London are currently doing, just hopefully gives, um, trying to formulate my words, um, gives an opportunity to have those discussions about what's going right and what's going wrong and, and not have people with scope, scapegoats mm -hmm. who are at the moment outside of the structures um, and processes when it comes to governing projects. One of the things I've seen in organizations that we've, we've, we've worked with over the years and, and when I was in um, consultancy is often there's a sponsor named in an organization and maybe a definition in their handbook, but the actual processes and procedures of how that sponsor should operate and work and the interfaces that they should be mm. interfacing with the people they're interfacing tends not to be in the guidance. Mm. So maybe having more formality around that will will help um, just a second part is has there been a commensurate reduction in what's expected of the person called project manager uh, over the same period of time i'm old enough to remember when most of the things on the sponsors to-do list were expected of the project manager that seems to have shifted and we've sort of uh, reduced the expectations on project full-timers 
maybe we haven't been doing them. I, I think they're both on the increase. One of the interesting things I found by analysing the bodies of knowledge, uh, so for example, the, the APM latest edition of the body of knowledge, it took me two days to go through with a fine tooth comb and identify all the things that the sponsor should be doing, because most of them weren't actually identified in the small section on sponsorship. They were spread across the other sections in the body of knowledge. Now, no sponsor is going to do what I did, is, is mad enough to do what I did, which is go through over two days and painfully go through what the sponsor should be doing. And one of the things I've learned in, in, in doing this work for the MPA is don't trust the index pages at the back of books. <laughs> it has no bearing on what's actually in the text. Um, but the, as you'll see in June, um, the list of what's expected of the sponsors within the body of knowledge that's hidden away throughout the body of knowledge is a considerable number of tasks and different from what you would expect um, of a project manager. But if you compare the earliest body of knowledge I've got is the fourth edition of, of the APM one from about 2000, very little said about sponsor. And in fact, if you compare what's expected of the project manager between the fourth edition and the seventh edition, that is increased as well. I think we do, I know we've got a number of uh, other people in the audience here today who want to um, ask questions, but I do just want to uh, see if there's any questions coming through from our online group. Yeah, Catherine, and then we'll come back to the group here. Yeah, so we've got a question from Dee Jackson. Um, the statistic regarding projects delivering their original objectives must be highly influenced by the um, inability to manage change. What could a CPA role potentially bring to organisations' ability to manage change and adapt to change? Yes, well, that's one of the benefits. When it comes to an organisation doing its own internal change, then you've got a person who is accountable for that. Um, the statistics in terms of project success and failure for internal business change programmes are actually worse than the ones that are presented for uh, project capital projects and major projects. Um, and for IT projects, if you isolate those, this, the, the failure rate is, is, is quite high. So having that person on the board, the voice of the board, um, could potentially make those internal change projects more rigorous, because uh, as we know, um, internal change tends not to be, and also we tend to do change to people rather than bring people along with that change. So perhaps having that voice at the table, uh, top table will help. There's one more question. Yep. Um, should the leader of the enterprise PRO be, able, be on the board and perhaps be um, named the chief projects officer? That's, I, I, again, and in fact, that was something I was going to say, but because of it, I realised I was ringing over that I didn't say. But the, another question around uh, the role of the chief project officer is, is the relationship with the project management office, if there is one within the organisation, whether they are the head of that. PMO or whether the head of reports into that. And that's actually something that's been mentioned in some of the publications about a question that's still, still for discussion. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So coming back to the audience here, I know we've got some, some questions. So. Oh, thanks very much, Carl, uh, for a very interesting uh, talk and uh, many congratulations. And uh, as an associate professor of project management, I aspire to uh, <laughs> the day when I'm in that position. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, two things. One is just a comment on the uh, uh, kind of lack of success in delivering projects from the uh, data that you put up there. And I, I wonder if we do, don't do enough research into the lived experience of being and working on on projects and indeed we were together in February with the MPA uh, where I put my thoughts forward like that in uh, so if we look at construction as a project based industry we have the highest in work male suicide rate and maybe we should be looking at the lived experience of, of being on projects we might learn more and uh, be more successful on to the role of the CPO and my experience in practice uh, in London Underground um, we had a capital projects director and we had a head of strategy and the head of strategy, they were the sponsor and they ran the sponsor team. And we did the delivery in the yeah. capital projects. So as a project manager, this before I came to academia, uh, my project sponsor and myself, our relationship and 
um, all those things we did in your model around sense making and relating and the tension between us was very, very healthy in terms of successful delivery of, of the project that I was on. Do we remove that healthy tension by kind of putting every sponsorship and delivery under a single point? Mm -hmm. uh, should, should we try and retain the, the, t the tension uh, between those two separate functions? Yes. Again, that's something that would need to be determined about what is the line of accountability for the sponsors and what is the line of accountability for the project managers. Now, at the very top of the organization, they will come in the, the, the CEO as the, the ultimate um, accountability, and that's where those two paths meet. Um, but I, yes, that, that, that tension is good. Healthy tension is good because that drives innovation and creativity and what we want and the delivery of a successful delivery of our projects. So yes, we, we need to keep that healthy tension. Thanks. Um, thanks, Carl. Really enjoyed your presentation and congratulations. Um, just picking up on the failure rates of projects, um, how would you mes measure success of the CPO role and ensure it's bringing value to the business? Well, um, sorry. Well, you would hopefully. <laughs> <Taxing> <laughs> <one>. <laughs> Still hoping for an easy question. But never mind. Um, there's there's nuances about uh, around those statistics on exactly how you define success, but you would hopefully, uh, as it's one of the things that's currently lacking for sponsorship, is have measures in place in order to ensure that there is this awareness of how things are going. Um, is it so? so in 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 Ben. Blackberg's latest book, he takes a very rigorous approach. It, is, is it meeting, uh, pretty much is it meeting the aspects of the iron triangle? And then um, that's why you get a, a very low low uh, success rate because um, not many all projects would deliver on all those um, with, with what was originally asked for. So I agree that the chief project officer should be have metrics and performance KPIs that uh, they should be uh, assessed against as to what they are. Um, I look forward to your reflective practice papers. <laughs> as, as one of our star global MBA, accelerated <laughs> MBA students, uh, maybe you can help resolve that. <laughs> There's um, a gentleman at the back who has a, a question. Oh, which one? Man with white shirt at the back. <clears throat> Evening, thank you. I'm interested if there's a if you found any big differences between public sector and private sector programs, and how you would take some of your concepts you share tonight in sponsorship and the CPO into a um, public sector world. What we've actually discovered through the work through the MPA is actually the public sector, the large government organisations, um, typically based in, in around London, are actually more advanced in with this than. Um, public sector, uh, private sector organizations. And what you tend to find um, was Al, I'm going to use your, Al. So Al talks about the amateur sponsor where it, it's not as formalized as we see in um, public sector bodies. And so, yes, the, the, there is opportunity to learn across those sectors, but perhaps the learning is going from the public sector to the private sector and not necessarily the other way. So uh, my my experience within what's commonly known as Europe's largest infrastructure project is yes we have that. There's also then the counter tension which you put in your your presentation that just let the project managers get on with it. Yeah. So it's so it's how 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 far do they go and what's the reach versus letting the special purpose vehicles they've put in place allow them to get on and deliver it. And it's that tension. I find that tension is healthy. I'm coming to the comment from the colleague from TFL. Yeah. Um, it, it can work really, really, really well. And, and uh, ISP2 has got a really quite an interesting, mature sponsorship um, setup that my experience has actually worked quite well. Okay, that's good to hear. And we had a, another question as well in the back of the room, Abby. If I could just follow up on that question, 
Uh, certainly, most of my career has been in the private sector, and the bane of project success has been the, what I call the fantasy business case. Uh, to to what extent? Uh, obviously, there's there's more of a challenge to business case in the private in the public sector than the private sector. So, to, to what extent do you think that having a chief projects officer can basically reduce the instances of fantasy business cases triggering projects that are in, intrinsically incapable of delivering? Yes. This is a discussion we often have on our programmes, but usually from a life cycle perspective rather than a, a hierarchy within an organisation perspective, which is often we're committed to projects and changes by our senior leaders without those being rigorously tested at their early stages. And um, Ed Merrow, who, who's one of my heroes, who, um, and we've had guest lecture on our BP programs, talks about that early stage of a life cycle with those business cases that really should not get through and should be um, tested more. Too many projects survive those early stages that shouldn't. And perhaps by bringing that expertise to senior leadership, the chief project officer with experience of that can, can help with um, reminding their, their colleagues of, of, of that, that particular problem. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Sarah? Basic congratulations, Carl. Thank you. Um, and thank you for a really good presentation. Um, I'd just like to ask you about the relationship between um, what you would see as being the chief project officer and the portfolio sponsor or sponsors, if it's not the same person. So obviously in a more complex organisation, then there's going to be a very diverse portfolio. So I'm just wondering what you think would be the key components of that relationship and how that could potentially work. Goodness. <laughs> um, just re referring to a point made earlier, one of the surprises I've had by reviewing the literature is, is how little sponsorship is actually discussed at the portfolio level. And, I, and as I mentioned, it's something that I want to explore a bit more. Um, and I've had discussions with colleagues about whether the chief project officer is the ultimate sponsor of that portfolio. Um, you don't want to overload your chief project officer with the same problem that you would give to your sponsors in, in terms of giving them more and more work. So perhaps the portfolio director is somebody separate who reports in, but the chief project officer is the sponsor um, of, of that particular portfolio being run by the director. I know I've not answered your question because that was actually a, a quite a big question, which, which uh, would take days, I think, to. Uh, Unravel. I'm just, uh, I think we probably have time for another couple of questions. Catherine, can I check if we've had any more questions in online? Okay. I think we had um, a hand up, a couple of hands from the, the floor, and we'll take those questions. Hello, Professor Carl, and Thank congratulations, you. many congratulations. Um, I was struck by when you were talking about the SRO role um, in relation to the Iron Triangle because a lot of the current literature around project studies talks about value creation mm -hmm. by projects. And I'm wondering whether there's any um, aspect of that role by the sponsor or by the CPO, which actually looks at value creation, looks at realization of benefits and outcomes. So concentrates on the, the um, effectiveness as opposed to the efficiency. Yes, I refer you to my slide on the, the one slide literature review, because actually there is a point there about the, the role that the CPO can play in terms of value creation, and he uses those terms and benefits realization. And I did actually, when I was putting that point in summarizing the literature, I did think of you <laughs> um, when I was putting that together. So when you get a copy of the slides, um, um, that's the, yeah, so. And I think we perhaps have one last question. I think there was a hand up. I did see a hand up with somebody else. Yes, this gentleman here, Becky. <clears throat> I've known you for a few years now, and you're really enthusiastic about project management. And then over a drink or whatever, I'd like to know where that enthusiasm comes from because it's. <laughs> um, and it was a really good presentation, but in all fairness, I've never seen you do a bad one. 
Um, in my background in uh, defence, the projects that I've seen fail are normally down to price. So the, the scope remains the same, the requirements, the derived requirements remain the same, but the customer wants to drive down the price, which leads industry to exploit scope creep, put more prices in to get to the original price as far as they possibly can, because they know the customer's got a contingency budget, and we're trying to find out how we can eat into that to claw back the money. How would the CPO be able to influence the customer intelligence to go for a proper price rather than the cheapest? <laughs> That's not a complex question at that, all. That is probably a question about the most fundamental nature of, <laughs> of, of, of the problems that we face when we're bidding for work with the customer. Um, yes, the customer wants something quickly um, for the less price than usually the project will actually take. Um, yes. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. <laughs> Let's discuss over drinks. <laughs> Indeed. Paul. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your contribution to the discussion. It's been fascinating. And I think, Carl, there'll be uh, obviously plenty more discussions to be had over that uh, drink that I know you're looking forward to. Okay. Um, but we're going to hand over now to uh, Fiona Devine for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Carl. So can I just take this opportunity to thank Carl for sharing his insights um, and his from his huge experience in, in the world of project management, also to Eleanor for facilitating the discussion, and also especially to you for, for the Q&A session. So thank you all. And I'm sure we are going to continue this conversation in, for those of you in person, um, where we all have drinks just outside in the lecture hall towards uh, the mill area. So uh, drinks will be set out there. So please do stay if you can and join us for, for an ongoing conversation. Now, AMBS is known for its fantastic series of events. Um, and tomorrow we actually have our annual Grigor McLennan lecture. Grigor McLennan was the first uh, director of the business school when it was set up in 1965, the first of two business schools uh, to be set up in the UK, leading on business management and education. Um, uh, and Grigor in particular had a very strong commitment to social responsibility. So as, as part of our annual lecture this year, we're going to be joined by Laura Spence, who is a professor of business ethics at Royal Holloway University of London, and also a visiting academic at Said Business School at the University of Oxford. And the title of Laura's talk is going to be Taking SME Seriously, Social Responsibility for the 99%. So if any of you are still around with us tomorrow, do please join us. But let's offer a warm round of applause again to Carl. Thank you. Thank you.